Hey guys, Brian Cusco here at Triple B. Here on the central coast of California, we've got a much smaller population compared to our neighbors up in the Bay Area and our folks down in Southern California. And as a result, there are only a handful of serious hobbyists in our community. Lucky for me, it turns out one of them lives only a few miles up the road. Travis Johnson of Living Legless Reptiles. And Travis produced his first litter of red tail boas back in 07, and he's got an awesome beard. And he currently works with a growing collection of snake species, including pythons, boas, and colubrids. His diligence in acquiring lineage for the different localities he works with is impressive and results in some very high quality animals. Today, we're going to visit his snake room and see firsthand some of his awesome snakes. You're watching Triple B TV. have here um, so this is R Riley hey come on between us Riley mm -hmm. so living legless reptiles is a family business my wife and my younger son and my eldest daughter we are all a part of the business she's showing off this girl here this is a striped brettles python closely related to carpet pythons they're a separate species Head. They're uh, a big, fat, yeah. wide head. Yeah, they're very big compared to carpet pythons. Oh, this might they're, be my, this might be where I'm going. Your with favorite. Carpets. They're neat. <laughs> Look at that head. They're really neat. The striped. The this is a genetic stripe gene, um, which is uh, recessive. There's a hypo. There's a stone washed. There's some neat mutations coming out with these guys for sure. The striped gene kind of mutes their red color in a even a, in a normal wild type. Brettle, they're very, very red. Man, I don't care what happens with the pattern. That head is doing it for me, man. They're neat. Look at that. So these guys come from the central deserts of Australia. That's why they have that red color to blend in with the dirt. Blend in with all the red dirt. But yeah, they're a really, really neat species. They, they're definitely bigger than carpets. Do other do regular carpet pythons have a head like like that? Yeah, I mean, they can have pretty pretty big heads. Okay, because um, that's a fat head right there. That's, yeah, gosh, they have, I freaking love it. They're really neat. They have some real power with that. You know, be able to take, you know, birds and uh, brettles will eat bearded dragons and, um, you know, other things like that. So what do we have here? Caramel? Car so this is a caramel coastal carpet python. Caramel so coastal. Incomplete dominant. No. It's not an incomplete dominant. It's not incomplete dominant. What it's, is it? The super form looks the same as the... Oh, so it's complete dominant. So it's complete dominant. Okay. Cool. The super caramel can have more extreme variation, you know, to the mutation with the supers. I've seen supers that looked normal but proved to be supers. And I've seen the single gene caramels be just as extreme as, you know, as supers. So. You have pretty specific bloodlines with these caramels, right? Yeah, all of them have PowerPoint lineage from you know multiple generations of animals. Uh, the caramel gene came from Paul Harris in the UK, from UK pythons, and then was imported by uh, Nick Mutton. We have offspring from those animals. Most oh, of them were oh, bred into- Check out the babies. All right. So this is one of the babies of that girl we just saw. Yes, this is her baby. She's pretty. We had a nice clutch here in 2016. Mostly caramels. I think we got a 6.7 caramels. Some of those obviously being possible supers. Uh, I think we got four normals, 2.2 uh, normal coastals from that pairing as well. That's a pretty snake right there. They're awesome. They change, they're born red. As you can see, they're, they're starting to turn yellow now, uh, you know, being a couple months old. As babies, they're born brick red, and that's the big obvious Thing to tell comparing them to normals is the babies are real real brick red and then slowly change to that beautiful caramel yellow as adults it takes them about you know two years as babies they're kind of a little more ugly ducklings they change into really neat animals it's pretty gorgeous to me mom, mom was in shed wasn't she yeah yeah so this is obviously a boa constrictor but so this is boa constrictor longicata they've been called uh, tombs boas Long tail boas, they have kind of a lot of common names, but they're um, a small locality boa constrictor from Tombs, Peru. They get to be really, really neat. 
She's kind of dark because it's winter and it's cold. During different times of the year, depending on the heat, uh, these yellow in her saddles really, really brighten up and can be very jungle carpet-esque um, or pastel ball python-esque with that real, real bright yellow. The nose uh, seems to take this little kind of downturn. Yeah, they definitely have different head shapes and, and things. They're definitely not your common, you know, red tail boa or the color change is incredible. As babies, they're not this black or, or have any yellow, uh, but all of that comes in, uh, you know, over the first you know, two and a half years or so. But they're neat boas. They don't get very big. This is a full grown adult female. She was born in 09, so she's got some age to her. And you said you have some babies from this girl? Yes, we Let's do. Let's check those out. So this is a baby long tail. This is... Um, so they get much darker as they get older, right? that black? Yeah. The pattern will stay the same, but each one of those saddles will get real, real dark. Then the circles in between the saddles will get that yellow ring. And uh, you can really that see... That head spear will get darker. And you can still see the downturn kind of... Even with the baby head, you can still see a little bit. It's obviously much more pronounced with the adult. But right. You can still see where it's going to do that same downturn nose thing. Yeah. And then all the sides, they'll get that, that beautiful iridescence through them. All that brown goes away and uh, is replaced with blacks, silvers, even blues in that right along the side, just underneath the, the saddles. We'll get like iridescent blue, not just the iridescence, but blue, uh, just that like a silverish with a blue tinge. I see, I saw it on mom yeah. a little bit. You'd never believe that this is, you know, the same snake. I have pictures of mom that Look mom and dad like that look just like this. That's, that, a, that's amazing. So. That's the coolest thing about them, you know, and a lot of the species that we work with is that, you know, to watch that change. I really enjoy seeing something with every shed look different. They're a neat animal that if you don't want to work with a huge, you know, boa constrictor, they stay nice and small. What would you say is max length of a female? I think the biggest one I've ever seen is like six feet. I mean, so not very big at all for a boa. Not hand. very big. I mean, they're not the smallest of the boa constrictor clade, but they're smaller than a BCI. They're definitely, yeah, they're one. definitely smaller than any of the red tails or kind of common mutation animals that you're gonna see. Cool. This girl seems a little bit feisty. Yeah. Woohoo! She's still a baby, so these guys are a crawl K boa, a boa constrictor imperator a dwarf species that comes from a small island off the coast of Belize. So these guys get about like, three or four feet tops. They don't they don't get big at all. So the long tails are small, but these guys are really, really small. Really small. Yeah, absolutely. This is actually really not that far off from having an adult male almost. I mean, if you're looking for a boa constrictor that stays tiny and turns out really neat, these guys are, are definitely on top. And as adults, some will have hues of orange, a real nice silver, and the coolest thing about them is this, all the speckling. I see that, it almost reminds like, me of a, like a banana ball python right, or something. Right, exactly. So they have that kind of granite look to them that's really neat. I hope you're not offended that I compared you to a ball python, but I like ball pythons, so it was a compliment, <laughs> okay? <laughs> she doesn't mind. Tarahumara. So these are the Tarahumara mountain boas. Um, they're from a small mountain range in Mexico. Another dwarf species. Mexico, so are these gonna be some of the most northernmost boas? That, yes. Um, aside from a rubber boa or something like that? Yeah, these will be probably the most northern of the boa constrictor clade. They're really neat dwarf species that stays four feet tops. Their coolest thing about them is their pattern. They get this, you know, crazy, dark, cryptic, um, you know, pattern. That That's what I was gonna say. On. The pattern is yeah. really impressive. Almost kind of, almost like a BCO kind of pattern going on. Right, a bit, right, right. But just on a more of a brown background. Then, with the Argentines, they'll get far more black and white. These guys are more brown, brown and black. Now we've got an Argentine coming out too. We're saving it for last because it's my favorite. But there's an Argentine boa coming out. So you stick around, check it out. So if you want, you're looking for something that's kind of like the Argentine, but you want to stay small, you know, these are these are a cool option. So Travis was a little worried about these guys lighting us up. I think we're doing okay so far. We'll see. We'll see what happens. So these are the Solomon Island ground boas. Their Latin name is Candoya carinata pulsani. Well, got a pretty good grip yeah. for a ground boa. <laughs> yeah, well, they do climb. I mean, they're just not as tree-dwelling as some of the other K 
Candoya species. They prefer to go down in the leaf litter and hide a species from the Solomon Islands, so the Indonesian archipelago, and that's that's what that cryptic pattern that they've got going on is, you know, helps them blend in with the leaf litter and stuff like that. Look at that little flat head. Yeah, what well, a one of the Candoya species, the viper boas. So viper boa is very obviously a mimic to prevent predation for people to think that it's a predator a viper. or right. a viper. They're all, you know, basically a viper mimic. But the coolest thing about them is that they're so different in color. Even in so one these, litter. These aren't even morphs necessarily? No, or? there's no morphs that we know of. They're all just highly variable in their color. That's pretty the sweet. The pattern is so all- So these could very well be brother and sister and mom and dad could look completely different as yes. well? Yes. That's awesome. Yes. If you're breeding similar looking animals together, uh, you have a higher likelihood of having animals that look similar to mom and dad, but there's variation within, within that. You know, like this baby was captive bred and you look at his brothers and sisters, there's some that are brighter white, there's some that are more cream, there's some that are orange, there's some that are red, and even something like the pattern changes See, her pattern is outlined with red, and then she's got kind of that mute orange background. I can tell these are some of your favorites right here. Oh yeah, they're neat. They're neat boas. They stay really small, four or five feet tops. That head shape I mean, is such a Yeah, that head too. shape. There's just, there's nothing like that out there as far as their look. Uh, another cool thing about them is how sexually dimorphic they are. This is a four-year-old male. <laughs> what? Yeah. Now he'll get bigger. That's about as big of a male I've ever seen though. Okay. You know, slow growers, their metabolism is really, really efficient, really, really slow. The sexual dimorphism is crazy from size. Males stay very tiny and can easily live in a smaller aquarium compared to the females. Females can max out at like, you know, four to five feet-ish, um, as where a male will max out at like three feet. Cool, man. Awesome species. So this snake actually has a name. What's his name? Well, we call him Grumpy because as a baby he was... Happy? Yeah, extremely <laughs> happy to see us. And always wanted to hang out with us. Yeah, bull snakes are a really, really neat species though. At the moment, the only colubrid we work with. There's but, not a lot uh, of people that work with bull snakes, are there? There's not, mm, right? No, I mean, there's some really good people that, I mean, all of our animals are all from good captive breeders that are, you know, friends of ours and stuff. You don't see them nearly as much as, you know, something like you know, ball pythons or well, boa constrictors yeah. and stuff like that. They're neat, they're so neat. They get to be nice, big colubrids. Yeah, the coolest thing about them is the, the rattlesnake mimicry. Yeah, that pattern all the way down to the bands on the tail, just before they would be rattle. And the, they'll shake their tail in the in They'll the shake their tail in the leaf litter and it sounds convincing if you don't know what you're you know listening to. And they even have keeled scales just like a rattlesnake. So on each individual scale, there's a ridge it gives them that rattlesnake sandpaper type feel. When agitated or confronted with a possible predator, they'll open up their mouth. They'll get that big S standing S, you know, make them look as big as possible. They'll hiss really, really loud. I um, came across a little baby once in Arizona desert and it was, kind yeah. of, it was going at me a little bit. <laughs> yeah, they, they're very convincing that you don't want to mess with them. Even the head shape, when they're agitated and they start hissing, they puff their head out give them more of a V-shaped to you know, mimic that rattlesnake look. You got another one here, yeah, let's, let's pull out that other yeah. one. So this is an ivory form of a bull snake. So this is uh, two genes uh, combined. It's the hypo gene with the white-sided gene. The white-sided gene almost acts as a <laughs> I don't know if I wanna put my finger under your chin. Yeah, probably not. I really like these guys, they're, uh, they're a neat mutation that white color with that those dark black eyes. So we have a pretty wide variety and growing uh, collection of morphs of bull snakes. We'll definitely have some uh, some neat ones in the future. All right. All this right. Is my, save the best for last, Argentine <laughs> BCO. So, so this is boa constrictor ocidentalis, a species of boa constrictor that comes from Argentina. They're the most southern found boa very cold tolerant. It's probably why they're black. Makes um, sense. You know, really get that, you know, heat absorption. 
as babies they're kind of born kind of gunmetal gray you know, slowly over time they get this uh yeah my buddy had the one that was kind of black. like almost pink there's a line bred um, trait that uh, they call Max Pink by uh, Ancient Reproductions. He just started selectively breeding the pinkest ones and, and kept doing that to try and get that pink color because they'll be born with a little bit of pink in them. They'll have hues of pink, but it usually goes away over, you know, as they turn black. And you know, he just selectively bred, you know, that for that color to, you know, be stand to stand out more. We generally kind of stand, try and uh, selectively breed for the best white and gold coloration, but they're a neat, neat animal. Um, they get pretty big. They're definitely heftier and more terrestrial than uh, some of the other boas. You know, big females can get 10 feet and you know pushing 30 plus pounds. As babies, they they do a lot of hissing, and they actually have the interior of their mouth is. It's, like it's almost white. white. Yeah. Yeah. And so they get kind of a cotton mouth, you know, type of uh, uh, defense with regular handling. They they work out of that and turn out to be really, really neat. Pretty cool, man. Yes. Look at that. Yeah. So we'll have, you know, a couple litters of those guys later this year. This is an animal that uh, we produced back in 2013. Um, Hopefully we'll have some offspring. I'm on the list. Don't try to jump ahead of me. <laughs> <laughs> and like I said, they, you know, that color change from babies to adults is really, you know, magnificent to watch. Every shed, they can get darker and darker and more high white and more, you know, more golden and really, really neat. Awesome, man. Well, hey, Travis, I appreciate you having us in your house, man. And hey, showing us all you're always welcome here. Food. Thank you. Thank you. Those were some incredible animals, weren't they? You can find links below for Living Legless Reptiles' Facebook page, as well as their website. They'll soon be working with all the pythons, too. And now they don't just breed snakes, they do educational shows for schools and classrooms as well. If you happen to be on the Central Coast, please reach out to us. We need more friends to stay up with late at night and swap snake stories around the campfire. So make sure to leave some comments down below and let us know what you'd like to see in future episodes. Next week, we're going to be doing an update on our first hatchling, Mr. Pink. Until then, you've been watching Triple B TV. Y'all take care. <laughs> what?